the focus, as I understand it today, um, for our class is on the right to research, text and data mining, fair use and fair dealing in the Canadian context. And I know you've already had some excellent uh, sessions in the programme beginning to think about these issues. I'm going to um, try and bring a little bit of Canadian law into focus for you for comparative purposes and talk specifically about the scope of um, fair dealing in Canada, as well as maybe a little about the scope of the reproduction right in Canada to kind of build on what some of some of what you've heard um, from Matt Sag about his excellent work on non-expressive uses. It, it seems clear that we're at a critical time in um, thinking about the evolution of the law and its relationship to artificial intelligence as it's evolving very rapidly and being deployed in sort of every aspect of our lives. And certainly um, policymakers around the world are turning their attention to this question and asking um, specifically about how copyright law should either apply to um, the kinds of text and data mining processes we're talking about, whether it should attach to the outputs of AI, and generally what they need to do with their copyright laws in order to ensure that um, they don't fall behind in the global competition over AI innovation. Um, Canada's no exception here, so I just wanted to bring you sort of up to date with a few developments that have been happening when it comes to thinking about copyright and its application to AI in Canada. Um, first of all, in 2019, we had a Copyright Act review where a committee received submissions on all aspects of the Copyright Act since its um, amendment in and so-called modernization in 2012. And um, amongst other things, it received um, feedback and submissions on fair dealing and text and data mining, or what, the, what they referred to ultimately as informational analysis. And they arrived really at two conclusions. The first was that we should expand fair dealing in Canada to function a bit more like fair use in the US, and that specifically means not limiting it to um, particular enumerated purposes, which, as we'll see, is one of the issues we encounter in Canadian fair dealing, which makes it a little narrower than the US fair use. Um, it also spoke or anticipated a little the capacity then to include transformative uses as potential fair dealings, whereas currently transformative use in its own right is not a category or a purpose that we necessarily recognize as a dealing purpose. Um, and they also concluded that we should be expanding, expanding sorry, the um, Copyright Act to facilitate the use of works for informational analysis specifically. So that all looks promising. It won't surprise you to learn probably that nothing has really <laughs> happened since then to make these things a reality, but at least we have this sort of statement that this is a direction the government might want to move in. Then we had this government consultation um, paper in 20, 2021 focused specifically on AI and copyright, and it raised issues around originality and ownership, um, liability, potential collective licensing responses and exceptions. It's quite a thorough and a, an impressive document um, it, for, in its own sake, in its own right, and covering the sort of landscape of um, questions that remain to be asked or answered about how the law applies to AI. Um, there's been a little bit of movement um, since this time on and the question of originality and AI authorship. So the Canadian Intellectual Property Office kind of jumped the gun, arguably, um, by registering something that was um, co-authored by an AI. But otherwise, um, nothing much has happened. And we're still waiting, really, to see the government's response, having consolidated all the submissions on the AI and uh, copyright consultation. So our focus here is on um, TDM and fair dealing specifically, but I wanted to start by talking a little bit more generally first about how I approach or think about the whole issue of the interaction of AI and copyright, because I think like in everything in copyright doctrine, our understanding of copyright's nature and its purpose really tells us how we should be approaching these doctrinal quandaries when they arise. Back in, um, I think, 2018, 2019, I co-wrote a paper um, with Ian Kerr called The Death of the AI Author. 
And Ian's work was really concerned with understanding AI in social and relational contexts. And so together we tried to argue um, that the whole concept of an AI author is based on a sort of oxymoron. The AIs are incapable of authorship properly understood. So we were trying to explain that when a sort of neural network writes a screenplay or something, it's simply predicting the words that might logically be strung together into a sentence and then into a paragraph, and that might look like it's functionally equivalent to what authors do when they string words together. But as Ian explains in this quote here, um, it's really not, it's a very different thing. So the AI neither knows or understands nor appreciates the connotation of its words, the meaning or the value of the work as a whole. And so the, our concern was that the way we talk about AI and the way we talk about robots often implies that there's some kind of expressive agency or an intentionality that's sort of inherent um, in authorship and in reading and receiving information and something that, that um, AI is capable of. And so we were really making an ontological argument. AI is computational. These kinds of expressive uh, communicative intentions are not. Th these two things are just ontologically different. But if we make the mistake of imagining that the AI can be a creative author, we're making a category mistake, right? We're attributing to technology this kind of expressive agency, emotion, meaning, feeling, intentionality that they simply cannot and do not possess. So no matter we argued how much AI generated works might look like works of human authorship, they are fundamentally different. And the one mistake we mustn't make in our policy reform is to treat the AI as if it is an author or has this capacity when it doesn't. And this sort of takes us to a question or brings us to a position on what good sort of tech neutral policy making means when we're thinking about how the law should respond to new technologies like artificial intelligence. And the, the point really is that we shouldn't just be reasoning by sort of false analogies and extending categories, that we should be regulating the technology as is and not as if it's something else. So that's my way into to raising a, a the, the topic of technological neutrality as a guiding principle in copyright. And in this regard, the, the idea is that there's um, a way in which we should approach technological evolution and change when we're engaged in lawmaking. And the way um, we shouldn't do it, and the way I think we too often do, is that we'd simply extend the law and its concepts to apply to the new technologies without discrimination, as though the technological activity is the same. Um, even if it's functionally equivalent, we treat it by analogy as though it must be um, the same thing and the law should regulate it in the same way. So we might say, you know, if AIs generate works that look like authorship, then they're doing something that's functionally equivalent to authors, so we should treat them the same. And you know, this is what uh, sort of we cautioned against in the death of the AI author paper. And it's something that reflects a view of technological neutrality that I've cautioned against in other work. So instead, what I suggest is that rather than the sort of formalist approach to tech neutrality, we think about a more substantive version of the principle. So it's kind of like what um, you know, a substantive equality is to formal equality. Um, the default assumption under this model should be that we're trying to regulate new technologies with a view to the same public policy goals and values that have traditionally informed the law. And it's these, the thing that should be technologically neutral are these sort of larger normative objectives, the, the sort of purposes of regulating this area the way that we do and traditionally have. So then if the purpose of copyright law is to encourage authorship, to foster a vibrant public domain, then um, substantive tech neutrality means that we should be applying copyright to emerging technologies in a way that consistently advances these objectives, right? So I think in AI, that means we should be asking what approach in copyright law will encourage the kind of creative, um, authorial, 
meaning-making practices that we're hoping to foster in service of this vibrant public domain. These are the sort of policy goals of the copyright system as I see them, right? Encouraging this kind of creative practice, encouraging access to knowledge, the exchange of information and ideas, and this sort of collective drive to meaning. And this is what we should be focused on. Um, in the Canadian context uh, or the Canadian formulation, we think about um, the copyright purpose as being a balance between promoting the public interest in the encouragement of works and obtaining a just reward for the creator and thereby sort of promoting the public interest and developing a robust public domain. And so that's what I take as the sort of, um, you know, the, the guiding principle of balance that should be informing our approach. So our question becomes, you know, should we be protecting AI generated works? And will that encourage copyrights creative practices? That's the thing that we answered no to. Um, and also, you know, if we're asking the question, should we be permitting text and data mining and the use of artificial intelligence to extract information and share knowledge about works, then the answer should be yes. Or we can apply the same kind of logic to the debate about AI training inputs. Right. And so do the, do the copies made in the context of text and data mining, do they infringe copyright? And here, drawing on the same logic as, as Matt has so nicely explained to you, um, the suggestion is, well, works of authorship are a communicative act, as I've described it, right? that they're intended to generate thoughts and feelings and emotions in their audience, whereas a machine is not capable of such a reception or such a response. And you know, taking the copyright purposes um, and objectives seriously, we can say that the AI or the technology itself is not an addressee of the author's expression, right? Its use of the work is purely functional as a source um, from which um, unprotected data can be extracted um, and not as a receipt of the meaning or the message of the work as a work of expression. That's my understanding, and I think that's consistent with what we've said as well about AI authorship and technological neutrality. Copyright just isn't and shouldn't be concerned with the technical duplication of works as useful things, um, but with those relational processes of creative expression and with the dialogic exchange of meaning. And so, when the machine is you know, essentially scanning documents for data points, it's not the addressee, it's not the recipient. Um, the work as processed or the text as mined is not an utterance in a dialogic chain. It's not the kind of use that's really within the ken of the copyright system or its purposes. Okay, so that's my big sort of theoretical um, argument. What I wanna do now is, you know, give you a sense of whether this is just um, wishful thinking in the Canadian context and where the jurisprudence is and the extent to which it might align with this kind of analysis. In Canada, there is, it's not wholly clear exactly what the scope of the Section 3 right of reproduction is. I like to think there's some room for argument. We had originally a case, um, SOCAN and CAIP, which was sort of in the early days of comparing fax machines and then thinking about cash copies of works being exchanged. And the court um, in that case had no problem arriving at a conclusion that a copy that's just a cash copy is just something that's saved for technological purposes, that essentially its reproduction is content neutral. And so it shouldn't have any legal bearing, at least on um, understanding the communication between the content provider and the end user. And so even though cash copies were being made, the court just didn't see or imagine for a moment really that a reproduction was happening that would implicate the reproduction right. The focus was all, only upon the nature of the communication and whether it implicated a communication right. So that was a nice start that had some promise. We then though have this troublesome case um, the. Uh, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and Sodrac case, which was in 2015. 
And in that case, the question was whether broadcast incidental copies that were made, so copies that are made in the process of broadcasting, um, are as digital reproductions are themselves relevant reproductions for copyright licensing purposes. And in that case, there was, in my view, an excellent dissent that really did take the idea of substantive tech neutrality seriously and found that these copies were not copies that implicated the reproduction right. Unfortunately, the majority in this case held that indeed they were reproductions. And all you would do with the idea of technological neutrality would be to maybe that would affect the licensing rate that we would set to each copy that was made, for example, but it wouldn't change the nature of the legal analysis, which would tell us a copy is a copy. And that's the end of the story, really. Um, and so that was worrying and would have been if it was the end of the story. I think we've had a little bit of a turnaround most recently, just this summer, with the ESA and SOCAN case, which was a case about the making available right um, and how it related to communication rights and reproduction rights. And in this case, what was nice is that the dissent in the, um, the CBC case essentially became the majority um, ruling in this case, in the sense that there's a really clear articulation of a very substantive understanding of technological neutrality as meaning that what we want to do is preserve the appropriate balance between owners' rights and users' rights in the digital environment. And if there's a particular interpretation of the statute that is going to upset the balance between owners and users in a significant way, create additional costs, for example, for doing things in a different technological medium, then that is um, not the interpretation that we should favor, that we can assume at least as a default position that parliament means for the system to remain balanced. And that means that user rights are supposed to continue to be protected and in the same way and to the same extent. And so I think there's probably a lot that we can do with this judgment when thinking about the implications of protecting um, digital copies for TDM purposes and, um, and what sort of uses should be allowed to continue under as well the auspices of fair dealing. So if it's OK, um, I'm going to take a, just another couple of minutes to talk specifically about the question of and the user right to conduct research through text and data mining. And I'm sort of breaking down the analysis because fair use is a little bit more um, contained in Canada to fair dealing. And, you know, we would only get to the fair dealing or we should only get to the fair dealing analysis if there's a reproduction that implicates the reproduction right. So my preference would be to say we don't need fair dealing. We don't need a specific user right because um, the kinds of copies that are being made as non-expressive copies are not um, reproductions. But to be on the safe side, <laughs> it's also good to have an articulated user right um, and or a defense if a reproduction is found. We do have some possible sort of solutions that are contained within the act. Um, one is a specific exception for reproductions for technological purposes, but these are really um, very limited and applies only to ephemeral or transitory copies. So that means that when copies are being made and stored in a database, for example, that you're not going to be able to benefit from that exception as it currently stands. We have um, an exception for non-commercial user generated content. So that means that if you take a new work and then use it for non-commercial purpose, sorry, you take an old work and you create out of it a new work, a transformative work for non-commercial purposes, um, that you may benefit from this new exception that's never really been applied in a meaningful way in the cases as yet. Um, but we're not quite sure what its scope is and certainly it's limited to non-commercial uses. So then we turn more optimistically to fair dealing for research which is an articulated purpose or an enumerated purpose within Canada's fair dealing provisions. Um, the main thing that makes fair dealing more narrow than fair use is that you have to get over that first hurdle of showing that you fit within um, the enumerated purposes. And so, so long as the kinds of uses we're talking about are for research, 
private study um, or education, we're going to be able to pass that first hurdle. And I think research here is quite capacious, as we'll see, and has the potential to be very helpful. And then once you get through that, you just engage in a fairness analysis, which essentially is going to use the same factors in Canada as you've already um, considered in Matt's talk, thinking about fair use. So just to position this then in terms of Canadian policy, we have um, a strong articulation of the idea that fair use or fair dealing is a user right, right? That it's something that people are entitled to do and that these user rights are a central part of the system and how copyright achieves its purpose and maintains that balance. The Supreme Court has said this on numerous occasions in a way that makes us think that um, the user rights language is powerful and something that we can rely upon here. Fair dealing for research specifically has also been broadly interpreted. In the original fair dealing case that cast uh, fair dealing as a user right, we were told that research um, deserved a large and liberal interpretation. In the Sokan and Bell case in 2012, it was given that when the court concluded that consumers who were just like looking for and listening to streams of samples of songs to see if they wanted to purchase them, um, were engaged in research. And I think this is what Sean was alluding to at the start of the session, this idea that even like consumer research for these sort of um, market purposes was considered to be um, within the realm of uh, research and therefore allowed the application of the fairness factors leading to the conclusion that this in fact was fair dealing. Fair dealing has been in a little bit of a, a ride or a roller coaster in recent years in Canada, but our most uh, recent case uh, is York University and Access Copyright, and that was a case about educational fair dealing, but we saw there a really nice re-articulation of the idea of user rights as a central part of the balance, and thinking not just of fair dealing as being something that aids transformation and downstream creativity, but also the important role that it serves in um, aiding the dissemination of works and providing users with the tools to generate works of their own and recognizing that this is a primary goal of copyright, which again, I think positions as well for making the argument that text and data mining should be fair dealing or currently is fair dealing in Canada. That said, we ultimately concluded in our submissions that the Canadian statutory landscape is uncertain right now and will have a chilling effect on anyone who really wants to engage in TDM activities here. We also pointed out that statutory damages, if every copy is a copy, could be enormous and that that potential liability itself is so staggering that people might be chilled from engaging in it unless or until they have some reassurance in the form of a specific exception that they can read and know applies to them. So we certainly argued that we need to do both um, the broadening of fair dealing to ensure that transformative uses um, can fit within the purposes of fair dealing and also we asked for a specific exception that would make clear either as part of fair dealing or as an additional exception that text and data mining was non-infringing activity. So I'll leave it there for now and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you to the to you both. Uh, I think the uh, you know the connections between the two themes of your of your lectures are really useful and thinking about what does a machine do in relation to a copyrighted work versus what do people do in relation to copyrighted work? And I think it very much evokes one, I believe it's an exception, although I read it in different ways in the, in the Japanese uh, law, which really does focus on the emotions of a work. And that's a, a concept that, that Karis raised uh, you know, numerous times. Mm -hmm.